Um, but this morning, we're back in the book of Romans. If you're new, we've been uh, studying Romans really for all of the fall, and we're back in Romans 3 and 4 this morning. So uh, let's pray, because you need to remember everything that you've learned and put it all together and understand God, all right? So let's, uh, let's, we need help with that. Father, um, I do pray that you would help us to preach. And Lord God, uh, there are all these dots. I see all these dots, all these little different pieces. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would connect the dots through the power of your spirit, that you would do that, uh, Lord, with scripture, with our lives, and uh, Lord, um, well, uh, connect it in such a way that we would see the truth. And Jesus, you are the truth. Um, Thank you for the fact that um, you are good, you're the good. So be glorified in us, Lord God, as we speak. And whatever is not of you, Lord, I just pray you'd wash it away. Um, Help us to see you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Most of my life, I've been a a dweeb, except for three glorious months um, in high school. Uh, First three months of ninth grade year at Heritage High School, I was on the soccer team. And uh, we were good. One Friday night, me and some of my soccer buddies went to the uh, varsity football uh, game in, in Littleton, uh, and as usual, they, they lost. Leaving the game, me and my soccer buddies, we were all hanging out the windows of Bobby Van de dad's green AMC Matador sedan. Remember this car really well. And we were yelling at the top of our lungs, football sucks, soccer rules. Football sucks, soccer rules. Woo, it was awesome was exhilarating, because I was cool. It was cool. We were yelling this to the crowd of disappointed football fans leaving the game on either side of Littleton Boulevard as we approached the intersection with Broadway, all hanging out the windows, yelling, including Bobby, who was driving, who had just gotten his license and didn't notice that the light had changed and the cars in front of us had come to a stop. We were all yelling, boasting, exalting ourselves when we slammed into the line of cars lined up in front of us in the midst of all those football fans from our high school as they were leaving the game. No one was physically injured in any serious kind of way. But as we sat there waiting for the police, my ego was just crucified. I was mortified. I, I, I died a bit. I think it was the worst feeling I've ever felt, or I had ever felt up to that point. I was humiliated. I'd made soccer my life, and so I literally thought I was my boast. Soccer rules, football sucks. I'm somebody because I am on the soccer team. That following year, I was cut from the soccer team. I found a hole down behind my house, down by the railroad track, sat in the hole, and I wept as if I had gone to my own funeral. And in a way, I had. Because you see, I thought that I was nothing but my boasting. And undoubtedly, you think to yourself, how silly. And yet I suspect that you are exactly the same. If someone says to you, tell me about yourself, Um, Who are you? Who are you? What do you say? My guess is you boast. I mean, you say things like this. I graduated from this school. I graduated from that school. or, Or maybe you say, you know, I chose to not waste my time with any more school, but move on to a rewarding, uh, a rewarding career, an honest trade. Or, or maybe you say, I love the arts, and so I paint, or I love adventure, and so I like to ski. Or if you're courageous, maybe you say, I'm crippled, or I was abused, or I was rejected and defrocked. But maybe you say it in such a way that you make yourself a victim, which you know, in a backhanded sort of way, is also a boast. I would have if I only could have. Or maybe you say, I'm a believer. But is that a boast? Whatever the case, we all, we all boast, right? And we think that we are our boasting. You could call it a resume. 
We boast in our ability to know the good, choose the good, and do the good. It's how we justify ourselves. We boast. Over Christmas, my son John was home and cleaning out his old room in the basement. He found this. And I remember he came up to the me and said, Dad, Dad, I found your old trophy. Found your old trophy. Ironically, it's the figure of a boy passing the ball. It's the only trophy I've ever received. The year after the car crash and just after being cut from the team, some of us formed a club team. And at the end of the season, we all got these little trophies. It says, uh, Double A champs, but I felt like a double A chump. And so long ago, I left it in the basement because it didn't feel like a trophy to my success, but a trophy to my failure. It is what became of my boasting. Humiliation. It's my only trophy, and yet, if I'm honest, I would suppose that I have another trophy. I, I hope that you don't mind me talking about this, but I suppose this is the most obvious way that our text for the morning refers to me. 20 years ago, we raised millions of dollars to purchase these three large office buildings and construct this 900-seat sanctuary on the side of Interstate 70 where the world drives by. At the time, I was preaching what I preach now. I believe the church was not a building, but that a building is simply a necessary tool in a temperate climate. And I thought that uh, everything that's anything is grace, including our ability to trust that everything that's anything is grace. But if I'm honest, uh, to me, this building also felt a little bit like a trophy to all of my hard work and all of my faith and all of my success. I would never ever say this out loud, but I know that I'm constantly tempted to think this. My church rules and your church sucks. I'm somebody because I'm the pastor and I deserve a trophy for passing the ball. When we raised money for the building, we needed a slogan. That's what the building campaign group we hired said. And so I came up with the slogan, where the world drives by. I meant the gospel, where the world drives by. But I suppose that I also meant a trophy to Peter's success, where the world drives by, where the world drives by, a trophy. And the world still drives by. But ever since I was defrocked and removed, it's felt like a rather different sort of trophy. <laughs> Something a little more like my old soccer trophy. And a reminder of the worst feeling I ever felt. We've been preaching through Paul's epistle to the Romans. And in our last sermon from Romans, Romans 3, back before Christmas, Paul suddenly asked this question. So what becomes of our boasting? Romans 3, 21 through 4, 25. Now this is the English Standish ver version, but I'm gonna insert uh, sections from the King James Version and the Young's Literal Translation because modern translators can't seem to take Romans literally for some reason. Chapter three, verse 21. But now the righteousness uh, dikaiosune. Now this is important to always remember. In, in biblical Greek, righteousness and justice are this, really the same word. It can be translated either word. It's all based on the same root, dk. But now the righteousness or justice of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through the faith of Jesus Christ. Now this is a huge topic, all right? Geek out with me for a minute, okay? A huge topic in the study of Paul's epistles. There are multiple places in, in, in modern versions where the translators will translate two Greek words as faith in Jesus, faith in Jesus, while older translations and literal translations will translate those two words as the faith or the faithfulness of Jesus. 
It has to do with whether the phrase is taken as a subjective genitive, meaning that the faith or faithfulness is what Jesus does, that is, it's Jesus' faith, or whether uh, the phrase is taken as an objective genitive, meaning that the faith or faithfulness is what we do, that is, our faith in Jesus, the object of our faith. Paul clearly uses the subjective genitive, um, that it's uh, uh, meaning of, clearly uses the subjective genitive in, in reference to faith many times in his letters because his statements can't be understood any other way. Like in just a few sentences, he's going to talk about the faith of Abraham. He's not saying we have faith in Abraham. He's saying about the faith of Abraham. But there is no place where his statements must be an objective genitive, and most genitive most genitive substantives simply express possession or origin, okay? So you can forget all that if you want to, but the most literal and obvious way to translate this is the faith of Jesus, but it's also translated uh, by modern translation as faith in Jesus. So we have to ask this question. Is it our faith that manifests the righteousness of God, or is it Jesus' faith or the faithfulness of Jesus that manifests the righteousness of God. Because that's how Paul's using it in this sentence. And Paul has just spent three chapters, hasn't he? I mean, you've been here through the fall. Three chapters arguing that all humanity is unfaithful. You see, if Paul is talking about our faith in God, maybe we could boast. We could think of faith as our own good decision or our judgment. In other words, we could you know, learn about Jesus, come to church, learn about Jesus, then decide about Jesus, and then boast in our decision and call that faith. We could judge Jesus, so choose Jesus. I have decided and call that faith. We could take knowledge of the good and so make good decisions and call that faith and boast in our faithfulness. But if Paul is talking about the faith or the faithfulness of Jesus, Well, we couldn't boast, at least not in ourselves. It's his faith. Another way to say that would be it's his righteousness. So if his faith becomes our faith, it's because he gave it to us. And that's called grace. Okay, done geeking out, enough said. Chapter three, verse 21. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. That's the knowledge of good and evil written down and put in books, right? Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through the faith of Jesus Christ for all who believe, all who are faithing, literally the believing. Now he's already told us that no one is righteous, no one seeks, in other words, no one has faith. So now if some do have faith, where did they get this? faith. The faith of Jesus Christ for all the faithing, the believing. Next verse. For all have sinned, that's a lack of faith, and fall short of the glory of God and are justified, they're made right by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. It's in Christ Jesus whom God put forward as a propitiation through the faith, as Tony sacrifice, through the faith in his blood, this was to show God's righteousness, God's justice, because in his divine forbearance, his patience, he passed over former sins, our lack of faith. It was to show his righteousness, his justice, at the present time, so that he might be just, or right, and the justifier, the one who makes right, uh, the justifier of the one who has the faith of Jesus. So you get that? God's justice is to make us just. And now this is utterly fascinating. Paul tells us that we are justified by the following things. Chapter 3, verse 24, we just read grace is a gift. Verse 26, the faith of Jesus. We're going to soon read, verse 28, faith apart from work. So the faith isn't our work. Chapter 5, verse 9, the blood of Christ. We have now been justified by his blood not just declared right, but made right with his blood. God's justice is to make us just with faith. 
In 325, Paul just told us that the faith is in his blood. You know, we've been talking about theories of the atonement. But according to Paul, the thing that happened at the cross is like some sort of universal blood transfusion. And now I want to remind you that Paul is a rabbi. He's steeped in Scripture. And Scripture has been painting a picture for all of us for all of time. Uh, A picture, well, at least for thousands of years about all of time. And the entire thing is about this. This tree in the middle of the Garden of Eden, the Garden of Calvary, the Garden City of New Jerusalem, two trees that uh, somehow are in one spot or one tree that looks like two, and and that picture lies at the heart of, of this picture in the inner sanctuary of the temple, which turns out to be a body. The temple is the body of Christ, which is us, for we are individually, says Paul, members of that body. Well, any body that refuses to receive blood and bleed blood, that is, that refuses to pass the ball, the life, is not right. And must be made right for the sake of the entire body. It must be justified. Well, this is how God makes us all right. The blood of Christ. The righteousness of God given to us. We're justified by faith as a gift, and the faith is in the blood, like breath is in the blood, like spirit and life are in the blood. And now check this out. God does not only justify us, He justifies all. Paul just said so. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift. For the rest of Romans, Paul's going to keep defending this statement, bring up arguments against it and defend the statement. 20 years ago, it was like I just could not escape from that statement. So I began preaching the statement. And everybody seemed thrilled. Until about 15 years ago when someone in authority said, hey, wait a minute. Do you actually mean that? And I said, well, um, I think so. I, I hope so. And then all sorts of people seemed to get just incredibly scared and very, very, very angry. I now get calls from people all over the world. And oftentimes they share their stories and they usually say something like this. This is such incredibly wonderful news. And now I see it all over scripture, but I just don't understand why so many people get just so scared and angry at the mere suggestion that it might be true. At first I didn't understand either. But over the years, I think I've come to understand all too well. For others and for myself, because you see, I get scared and angry too about myself. Because you see, if God justifies everyone, then no one can justify themselves. That means no one can boast in themselves even if they believe that they are justified and all are justified, for even that belief is the gift of God. In other words, salvation is humiliation for all. Salvation is humiliation for you are being saved from yourself. You know, you, you know that thing that you boast about, that thing that you think is yourself, your pride, your ego, your flesh. It must be cut off. Circumcised, if you will. Forsaken and excluded. Verse 26. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be right or just and the justifier of the one who has the faith of Jesus. Verse 27. Then what becomes of our Boasting, asked Paul. Answer, it is excluded. 
excluded, cut off, forsaken, cast out, for it forms something like a tough skin around the heart that keeps you from intimate communion, that keeps you from the ecstatic joy of loving and being loved, that keeps you from living the life that God has given you. Verse 27, then what becomes of our boasting? It's excluded by what kind of law? By the law of works? No, but by the law or the, or the way of faith. That is trust. To live by the law is to trust your own judgment using knowledge of good and evil taken from a tree. That is to trust dead knowledge. But to trust a person is to surrender your judgment to another's judgment, right? We talked about this. It's to surrender your judgment to another's judgment. And so you don't boast in your choices. You boast in the choices of the one you trust, who is living knowledge, living knowledge. And Paul's talking about living knowledge not only with you, but in you. Paul is saying that faith in you, which is righteousness in you, is actually the spirit, breath, and life of Christ in you, for he has bled for you, winning your trust, but even more than that, he's bled into you, giving you his life. The life is in the blood. God's been saying this since Leviticus 17, given to you to make atonement. The name Jesus literally means God is salvation. Here's the humbling part. (laughs) That means you are not salvation. And if God saves all, it becomes just abundantly clear that no one can save themselves. And so all of our boasting is an empty illusion which nonetheless creates a prison which we often call hell. We hide in hell because we're terrified of the judgment of God. For the grace of God means that our boasting is excluded. In other words, we will lose our proud psyches in the presence of the living God. In other words, we'll be humbled. That is, humiliated. And for most folks, that's the worst feeling that they can imagine. And they suspect it is the end of them. And maybe it is. But in Scripture, the end is also the beginning. Verse 28, For we hold that one is justified, made right by faith, apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of the Jews only? Asked Paul. Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Now I want to remind you that everyone is a Jew or a not Jew. That's a Gentile. Is God the God of the Jews only, or is he not the God of the Gentiles also? Gentiles also? Yeah, God of the Gentiles also, since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. And I remind you that everybody is either circumcised or not circumcised. Who will justify the uncircumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means, which you know, should be translated, hell no. On the contrary, we uphold the law, we fulfill the law with faith. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather according to the flesh, Abraham? Now to us, that is a very abrupt transition, right? But to Paul and to the Jews, it made perfect sense. In the Gospels, the Jews were constantly boasting about how they're the faithful, obedient, children of Abraham, unlike the Gentiles, boasting that they will sit at table in the kingdom of God with Father Abraham, and boasting that they will be held close to his bosom in the bosom of Abraham for all eternity, Father Abraham. They boast in him, and they boast of him. This is interesting to think about, but more than any other person in all the world, including Jesus, people boast in Abraham. I mean, he, 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 the, the Jews, the Christians, and uh, the Muslims who changed some of his story, but they still boast in, in Abraham. He's exalted by people and he's exalted by God, but exalted in the strangest of ways, he is exalted through humiliation. You know, God chose him for no apparent reason. It's just the craziest story. Chosen for no apparent reason, made him the most outlandish promises, 
humbled him for decades, and then exalted him because he had faith. His humiliation is his exaltation. I think it's called faith. Even though I expect us to only comprehend a little bit of this, let's just read what Paul writes next. And then I want to remind you of Abraham's story and then encourage you to accept humiliation with joy. Chapter 4, verse 1. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, or our father, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified, made right by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Remember, faith is counted as righteousness because it is righteousness. God doesn't lie, and Jesus is our righteousness, according to Paul. Now, to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in, trust him who justifies the ungodly. Trust him who justifies the ungodly. Not some ungodly, just the ungodly. God justifies the ungodly. Him who justifies the ungodly, his faith, trust him, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Father, forgive them, said Jesus from the tree. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Paul tells us that love keeps no record. No counting, same word, logizomai, in all these different verses. No counting of wrongs. But love does keep a record accounting of rights. That's anything done in faith. Faith in the one who justifies the ungodly. That's what Paul just told us. Verse 9, is this blessing then only for the circumcised? Seems like a weird transition too, huh? But let me remind you, circumcision was the very first law, religious law, outside of the garden. And it was given to Abraham when he was, wait for it, 99 years old. That must have been utterly humiliating and utterly bizarre. It's utterly bizarre until you discover that it symbolizes the circumcision of the heart. And that's the place in which we hide from the painful presence of love, and God is love. God is our helper in Hebrew, Azer. In fact, there's a name, Eliezer, that means God is our help. Is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness of the faith that he had while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised, so that righteousness would be counted to them as well, and to make him the father of the circumcised, who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised, for the promise to Abraham and his offspring, his seed, that he would be heir of the world, that he would inherit the world, and that would include you, right? I mean, let's just take a shot at believing the Bible here for a minute. That means you have been promised to Abraham. The promise to Abraham and his seed that he would inherit the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. I think another way to say that is that if anyone earns anything, if anyone earns anything, no one can inherit everything, including Abraham. Verse 15, for the law brings wrath. Knowledge of good and evil taken and used to justify the self brings wrath. But where there is no law, there's no transgression. That is why the inheritance depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring. Well, who's his offspring? That's what all the fighting is about in the Middle East right now, I think. Guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to that of the, uh, of, of the law, but also to that of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. 
Gah! We are all his offspring, according to Paul. As it is written, I have made you the father of many, which often means all in Scripture, and here it obviously means all, because the way I've made you the father of all nations, in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead. Not some dead, just the dead, and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Whew. Amazing. So what does God call into existence? Everything. And how about faith in Abraham, which is the promised seed in Abraham, which is Jesus Christ in Abraham? See, it's like the last sermon we preached from Romans. Um, Abraham is like a virgin that conceives. And what does he give birth to? Salvation, Yeshua, Jesus. You know when a woman gives birth, she goes through intense labor, and it's humiliating. But when the child is born, she knows that the child is a miracle, and so she is not proud of the fruit of her womb. She's grateful. If you boast in your fruit of the Spirit, you don't know what the fruit of the Spirit is. And faith is the fruit of the Spirit. Faith is not a work of the flesh. Faith is the fruit of the Spirit. Faith is a miracle. So how does God implant that miracle in us? Well, in Abraham, he did it with a word a huge promise, a lifetime of humiliation, and an outrageous exaltation. Do any of you ever feel like God has made you a promise? And now years later you feel like that promise is your humiliation? Remember Abraham's story, Genesis 12.1? It's, I mean, it just, Take a shot at going back and reading your Bible and actually believing it, because it's like a crack up, okay? John, Genesis 12, verse one, God just speaks to this 75-year-old uncircumcised Gentile named Abram. And he just says to him, out of the blue, I will make of you a great nation and bless you, blessing those that bless you and cursing those that curse you. There are no conditions. He's just told to keep traveling in the direction that he had already been traveling. Genesis 12, 7, in Canaan, God says, to your seed, and who's his seed? To your seed, I give this land, but then there's a famine in the land. Abram flees, and then in fear of his life, he pimps his wife to the Pharaoh of Egypt. It's found out Abraham is humiliated, and then he returns to the land. Genesis 13, God promises the land to Abraham and his seed forever. No terms, no conditions, just, just forever. Outrageous promise. Genesis 15, a decade, decades later, God appears to Abraham and he says this. Fear not. And Abraham says, but uh, um, Lord, I'm childless. And Eliezer, my Syrian slave, is going to inherit everything. But God tells Abraham to go outside and count the stars. Count the stars if he's able and then he says to him, so shall your descendants, your seed be. Abraham believes that word and God counts it as righteousness. Then God cuts a covenant as Abraham watches. It's a covenant of grace because there are no terms and conditions for Abraham. In Genesis 16, when Abram is 85, he still has no offspring. And so he takes matters into his own hands. You remember the story. He impregnates Hagar, his wife's um, slave. If Abraham believes God, he also does not believe God because he tries to manufacture the blessing with works, his work, fornication. He, he maybe has faith, but it's only like the size of a mustard seed. It's really small, it's a little seed. Genesis 17, when Abram is 99, God says to Abram, 
Walk before me and be blameless that I may establish my covenant. You know, the land, the baby, and Abraham falls on the ground and laughs, just starts laughing. And then God says this, your name is not Abram, your name is Abraham, for I have made you. Not will make you, I have made you the father of many nations. Now, cut the skin from your tip of your baby maker and everyone else's baby maker, because your wife, Sarah, she's going to have a baby. <laughs> Genesis 21, when Abram, Abraham is 100, Sarah has a baby. They name him Isaac, which means laughter. Isaac is Abraham's laughter. Abraham's life. Isaac is God's promised blessing. But when Isaac is about 30 years old, God tells 130-year-old Abraham to go to the holy mountain and offer him as a sacrifice on a pile of wood. That mountain was also this mountain. Mount Calvary, which is also the Temple Mount and Mount Zion. And Jews believed that it was also this mountain, the holy mountain on which Adam is made in the image of God, it was Eden. God tells Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, and so old Abraham binds Isaac, and Isaac had to have agreed to this because he's 30 and his dad's 130. He lifts the knife, preparing to sacrifice his laughter, his life, the promised blessing. Because of some really terrible atonement theories, most modern Christians have really no understanding of the sacrifices and offerings in the Old Testament. Father Abraham was sacrificing his own heart on the holy mountain. He didn't hate the sacrifice. He was the sacrifice. Soren Kierkegaard calls this the teleological suspension of the ethical and the very definition of faith. For in this moment of supreme faith, Abraham had to believe that the good was not a list of rules, that is, ethics, that is, knowledge of good and evil that he could take, and, like, you know, fruit from some tree, put in a book, comprehend and use for his pleasure. In that moment, Abraham had to trust that the good was the word of the Lord that comprehended him and knew him. In other words, wisdom was not a list or a law or a formula. Wisdom was a person that knew him, loved him, and helped him, his helper. Abraham trusted his helper more than he trusted himself. And you remember that very first Adam couldn't even find his helper. The author of Hebrews writes that Abraham considered that God could raise the dead. He believed that God would keep his promise even if he didn't understand it. Many modern Christians say God would never ask such a thing, and I suppose that now, in a way, that's true. At the time, God had not given any laws except for circumcision, but now he's told us never ever sacrifice a child. He would never ask such a thing. And yet he asks such things all the time, doesn't he? God is sovereign. And he will ask all of us and each of us to surrender our husbands, wives, children, friends, homes, and even ourselves. We will all lose our psyche. We will all die. In fact, Paul is working his way toward this amazing statement in Romans 12.1. Therefore, present your bodies a living sacrifice. Well, on the holy mountain, on the holy mountain, Abraham sacrifices his judgment <clears throat> to the judgment of God, and that's called faith. And it is utterly humiliating. Yet the Lord intervenes and provides a substitute that we now know is his own son. 
his own heart, his very self. And actually, the promised blessing that is promised to Abraham, Jesus our Lord, who does die and is resurrected, even in us, his body, the household of faith. Then this is the kicker. God says this, Genesis twenty-two twenty-five: 25, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord. Because, because, because you, Abraham, have done this, this act of faith, and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you. And yet God had already promised, unconditionally promised, to bless Abram 50 years earlier when he was an uncircumcised pagan living in Syria. Do you see what this means? God knew that Abraham would have faith. Why? Because he knew that he would create that faith with a promise of humiliation and an exaltation. In Scripture, it's like everything depends on faith, but faith always depends on God. People will sometimes say, if you believe God saves everyone, you obviously don't believe faith is necessary for salvation. But I believe faith is salvation. And what they think is salvation is actually damnation. Their own judgment. But faith is a miracle. Faith is the Spirit of God flowing through our veins. Faith is Jesus rising from the dead in the tomb. That was your heart. God creates faith with a promise and a humiliation, which is the realization that you cannot create the promise. God creates faith with a promise, a humiliation, and an outrageous exaltation. God promises the blessing to Abraham and then uh, spends a lifetime humbling Abraham until Abraham fully surrenders the promised blessing on the wood on the holy mountain. Then God blesses Abraham beyond his wildest dreams, for in Abraham, God had created faith. So this is, this is a wild picture. Abraham gave it all, and he receives it all back and more. Romans 8.32, Paul's going to say, he gave us his only son. Will he not also give us all things uh, with him? Abraham gave it all, received it all back and more, but he received it back. This is the important thing. Listen closely. He received it back in a new way. You, you know, in the days of Abraham's flesh, he didn't inherit all the land. Actually, I don't, hardly got any land. And all the nations, he sure didn't inherit. And he still had to surrender Sarah and Isaac. I mean, he still had to die, right? But in the New Testament, Jesus tells some outrageous stories about Abraham. As if he really does inherit all things, and all things in an entirely new way. In the gospel, Jesus tells about many people, like the stars of heaven, coming from east and west and sitting at table with Abraham in the kingdom of God. In Luke, he talks about a man named Lazarus in the bosom of Abraham, and a rich man with five brothers on the other side of a chasm. Lazarus is a Greek form of the Hebrew name Eliezer. You remember Eliezer was Abraham's slave of whom Abraham had complained to God. My slave is going to inherit everything I have? Well, in Jesus' story, Eliezer is in Abraham's bosom. <laughs> He's back but in an entirely new way, not as a slave, but a brother. And the rich man with five brothers who despised Lazarus, that is Eliezer, he appears to be Judah, the father of the Jews. It's not that Judah can never get to the bosom of Abraham. It's just that he's going to have to watch Jesus, the king of the Jews, destroy the chasm first and give him a new heart and in the process of destroying the chasm so that he'll enjoy hanging out with people like Lazarus. My point is that you will inherit the blessing in all things with him like Abraham. But you cannot receive and enjoy the blessing in all things with him until you've been humbled like Abraham on the holy mountain. And that's because the blessing in all things with him are a gift. 
You cannot truly enjoy anything until you know that absolutely everything is absolute grace. So, <clears throat> what does become of our boasting? Well, on the holy mountain, our boasting becomes our humiliation, and then it's transformed into our exaltation, an eternal communion of love and laughter. Recently, I was really struggling with my old trophies of shame. And to be honest, I was really missing hundreds of old friends that 15 years ago, I lost. I asked Susan to pray for me, and she said, I, Peter, I, this doesn't make any sense to me, but all I hear is Philemon and don't count the stars. I thought for a moment, I said, oh, wow, you know, I think that makes uh, perfect sense to me. Philemon is the slave owner in the New Testament whose runaway slave takes refuge with the Apostle Paul. And so Paul writes to Philemon saying, perhaps he was parted from you for a while that you might receive him back forever, but not as a slave, as a brother. You know, like one that you would hold close to your bosom. As a pastor, it's easy to count attenders, like Abraham tried to count the stars, but then I don't enjoy you. I feel possessive of you, responsible for you, and insecure about you, and it's utterly humiliating when you leave. But when I surrender you on the holy mountain, which I have to do repeatedly, when I surrender you, I receive you all back, not as slaves to my ego, but like brothers at a great banquet. And everyone begins to shine like the stars. We used to call this the banquet hall. I mean, we even had a big sign above the doors entering the sanctuary, banquet hall. One day I will receive everyone back in a communion of laughter, love, and life as we all pass the ball in gratitude and praise. See, this is a trophy, but it's God's trophy. And you, my friends, the sanctuary, are a trophy, but you're God's trophy. And I am a trophy, a trophy of grace. It turns out that God just wants to share all of his trophies with each and every one of us. And he does it on the holy mountain. On the holy mountain, our Lord humbled himself, submitted to the humiliation of the cross. On the holy mountain, he took bread and broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. And in the same manner, he took the cup, saying, this is the covenant in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you. So I guess I'm saying, don't run from your humiliations. <laughs> for the only place to hide is hell. But face your humiliations with Jesus and humiliation becomes exaltation. Actually, it becomes a banquet of endless love. So maybe, so I was preaching, it occurred to you, hey, I have a trophy of shame. <laughs> well, this morning, why don't you bring your trophy of shame and place it on the table? So I think this is um, the good news. And as usual, the benediction, I'm saying believe the good news, okay? But I think this is the good news. God keeps his promises. Even if it looks like they've died, he keeps his promises. 
and you just ate the promise. <laughs> that means you are on quite a roller coaster. Humiliation and an exaltation beyond your wildest imagination. So have hope. That's what we'll talk about next week. And that's a wonderful thing to say and a terrifying thing to say. Because hope hurts, doesn't it? But have hope because God keeps his promises. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'd like prayer, uh, members of the prayer team will be down front here.